Um, welcome to Doing, Seeing, Seeing, Doing. My name's uh, Matt Ward. I'm the publisher of the book as Uro Publications, as well as the owner of the little bookshop in the corner here at uh, Collingwood Yards. Before we begin, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which Collingwood Yards is situated, which is the Wurundjeri people of the Woiwurrung language group. Um, I'd also like to extend my respects to their elders past and present and all First Peoples and elders past and present and future. Um, thank you to Shannon of Composite Gallery for hosting us today uh, and also a big thank you to the NGV for making this part of their Melbourne Design Week programming and Melbourne Art Book Fair programming this year. We are actually streaming the event, which is why we've got a couple of cameras set up there in the, in the middle of the room. If you're at the front of the stage here, the, the cameras are now live, so just be aware of that. Um, otherwise, it, it shouldn't be capturing you. Um, I'm joined today by Leon Van Skyke, Emeritus Professor of, um, of Architecture at RMIT University, and the author of the book tonight's event will be considering, Doing, Seeing, Seeing, Doing. I'm also joined by Professor Sue Ann Ware, a landscape architect and head of the School of Architecture and Built Environment at the University of Newca Newcastle. Um, doing, Seeing, Seeing, Doing, which is this lovely book that I have in my hand right here. Sorry, this is, I'm wearing my publisher hat now. Um, was released last year in the middle of the pandemic. Uh, we did it as an uh, initial limited edition uh, version that was hand printed by our good friend, Stuart Geddes, um, who's also probably one of the country's best book designers. Um, it sold out incredibly rapidly and we've since uh, reprinted it in a popular edition, which is what we've got here tonight. Um, of course, it is available at a small discount for any ticket holders, so if you'd like to purchase a copy, if you don't already have one, I'd encourage you to do so. Um, it is ostensibly a book about gardening, um, but it's certainly not your conventional gardening book by any stretch of the imagination. It's a blend of autobiography and anecdote, landscape and gardening history, and conversations with friends that makes for a, a refreshing, refreshingly non-linear structure and read. The story that emerges over time, though, is one that's centred very much on the powerful role that gardens and landscapes can have on our understanding of the world and of the world, and, and in turn on how we shape it, ultimately. So tonight's conversation is, is really intended to be quite informal, but of course I couldn't help myself and I've done lots of homework, which is why you're going to have to bear with me while I read through all of my questions. Um, Nevertheless, um, I'm, I'm hopeful we can we can um, we can find some interesting um, new takes on on what has become a, a bit of a sort of cliche, I guess, in, in terms of sort of gardening publishing generally. We're a, we're an architecture and design publisher, so our, our interest is probably a little bit different from your typical sort of publisher on on gardening, if you like. And I'm hopeful this conversation today is going to be a, a fruitful and, and fruitful and interesting one. Um, Leon, my first question for you is, um, is, is of course, about the book. Um, in one sense, this is a book about gardening, as I've just described. Um, and, and while it does have an, an explicit interest in the doing of gardening, hence the title, um, and even garden history, anybody who reads it expecting a, a conventional gardening book will be a, a, little, a little surprised by what they find. H how would you describe the book and, and your ambition for it? Goodness, Matt. <clears throat> Um, look, I think it goes, goes back to my fascination <clears throat> over many, many years with the concept of spatial intelligence. And that has been kind of the driving idea behind much that I've done in the sphere of, of education and commissioning buildings and working with architects in a, in a PhD program which has involved many fantastic architects from all over the world who come into a, a critical environment that we set up and work out how it is that they've come to do what they do and how they might do it better by understanding better what it is they're doing. Now, spatial intelligence is a, is a capability that every single human being has. And it's one that we're not usually very aware of because it's the, one of the earliest ones to be mastered. I mean, it's, as soon as you start crawling about and some people would say, um, as soon as you start dropping things out of a cot, you're, you're actually in, engaged in um, <clears throat> spatial explorations. 
And over time, you build up uh, your own mental space around your understanding of space and how you negotiate it. And it's very rapidly relegated to the humdrum, so it's not something that we're very often conscious of. So this becomes particularly interesting when you're talking to designers, because they often make decisions without thinking about what lies behind them. Education in the main introduces people to great works and, and suggests that by exposure to great works and in some way or another working with them, you, you eventually become an adept. You eventually master your field. Whereas in the background, all the time, even when you're studying the great works, you're looking at them through the lenses, pretty much concealed, of your own history and space. So I, I saw this book in many ways as an, an exploration and an, an explanation of how you might go back in time yourself and see what were the first times that you became spatially aware. So I see gardening as a spatial discipline. And I mean, that's, that's the part of it that mostly interests me. Obviously, anybody who tries to grow anything becomes fascinated by what might be described as the horticulture of it. But I'm not an expert in that area. But I, but I have I've had my successes and I've had my failures you know, in, in, in nurturing and, and extending and expanding. But what fascinates me every time is how has a garden come to be and, and what, what are the ideas that have caused it to be the way that it is? And I mean, every move in, in every garden that I've been associated with can be tracked back through history to examples. And so every garden, in a way, tells, tells a story. So hence the book is full of anecdotes, full of stories. Mm. Mm. I can go on. <laughs> No, I think it's a, it's a really important point because when we think about space, it's a, quite an abstract concept, isn't it? Yeah. Whereas what you're describing in the book is not that. It's very much, it's grounded in these very personal experiences, very intimate experiences with gardens, with landscape. And, and, I, and I wonder if, if there is a la relationship here to this idea of place as well, in a sense. And I'm not so sure about place. Um, I mean, I... <coughs> One of the things I do, there are several in the book. I mean, I, before I come to write anything, I, I create an ideogram, which is a little virtual theater, which I draw up. And it, in, into that, I try and put all the ideas that come into it. And this, it always has curtains. And, and then <clears throat> somebody who was talking here last week was looking at them um, when we were working on a project in London. She said, Leon, there are never any feet in your ideograms. And I suddenly thought, she's right. <laughs> and in fact, how do, how, do we, how do we engage with place? And I mean, when I, I remember you know, in, in Paris going to the Place Royale, and I pace it. I count so many paces that way, and so many paces that way. So is it, is it a golden rectangle? Is it a double cube? What is it? So, but it's all been done through my feet. On the other hand, uh, I think you know, I mentioned crawling uh, earlier. I mean, our whole relationship with space, it's not an abstract thing. It's, it's very concrete. It gets built up with our experiences of actually negotiating it, walking through it, crawling through it, swimming through it in, in some cases. So the doing part of this came from um, a concept which is is very familiar, the, the, the hand-eye, the, the mind, the body-mind thing. Like, do you do things before and then think about them, or do you think things and then do them? What actually is going on? Mm. And so that, that also lay behind it. And, and part of that goes to very specific things. I mean, <clears throat> we saw on television the other night, a, a little snippet of Clevedon, the, the, the great house on the banks of the Thames. 
um, in a program called Escape to the Country. But anyway, <laughs> which, and uh, I, I, one of my, when I was a schoolboy, I, I earned pocket money by working in that garden. And my job was to deadhead the rhododendrons. And this is in the, it's in the book. But I'm part of, if you can imagine, being in this stunningly beautiful little valley, and there are beech trees over it, and there's grass running down, and there's a stream that eventually the valley goes to the Thames eventually. <clears throat> and, right, Thames. <laughs> <laughs> Oh no, quite. That's a, that's, a, that's a very spatial skill right there. That <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the I'm stand. I'm I'm working in the, in the, in the early spring after the flowers have gone over, deadheading the rhododendrons, and it, it's days of work just going through. And your fingers get sticky, and on top of which, it's the weather isn't constant. It's coming over, it's you know, April showers, so you're getting wet, you're getting dry, you're getting hot, you're getting cold, and you're doing this. And indelibly that whole process is cementing in place a, a, an understanding of a valley, and particular valley. So then I begin to think about all the other valleys that I might, might have encountered. Um, and, the, and then the thing that fascinated me about that was that, of course, it's not just us in the garden doing seeing. Things are happening. And down the bottom of that valley was a boathouse. And in that, the then Minister for Defence, John Profumo, was meeting the model Christine Keeler. <laughs> and this was all going on while I was deadheading <laughs> rhododendrons. <laughs> I have to say, it didn't have much to do with gardening, but I really enjoyed that <laughs> anecdote. There's a few like that in the book. Maybe it does have a relationship I haven't quite connected to yet. But it was good. I think it does, because every space... I mean, you can't look at Clevedon, for example, without that particular story coming up. And even in Escape to the Country, there's a mention <laughs> of it. <laughs> Freighted with history, in a sense, this is the symbolism. Um, I've got a, you're going to have to bear with me while I, while I read a quote from the book. I apologise. While our minds may range over vast terrains, most of us have agency over a quarter of an acre or less. We don't get Clevedons, obviously. We have little gardens, little balconies in my case. Even so, we each have the possibility to act as either a spoiler, restorer or improver. It's in our quarter acres that we reveal our mindsets. Sue Ann, the, the book also includes some correspondence between yourself and, and Leon, wherein you're relating some of your work with Indigenous Rangers in New South Wales and, and their particular way of caring for country. One of the characteristics of that care is, a, is actually a tolerance for non-native species. Some, some of us think of them as weeds. Um, and at one point in the book, Leon describes the planting scheme for his own garden at Woodend, which is a, a series of beautiful passages. Um, it's far from a weedscape, obviously. But it, but it does blend both native and non-native species. Um, and at the, at the same time, there's a very clear interest in this garden and in the book with, with a sensitivity to the, now I've said specifics of place, but that, that might, be, might be slightly off piste I'm not sure. But, but generally the specifics of, of that, the, the space that Leon finds himself in there at Woodend, or found himself in there at Woodend. Um, and of course, now I need my question, which is on the next page, and I've lost the thread of it. <laughs> Well, the question is obvious, an obvious one. Is there a tension there? You know, there is that, that idea of a kind of a native species being the appropriate species for this country. Yeah, so this is... Um, I'm, my partner in life is also a landscape architect, but as you can tell from my accent, I'm not Australian. I'm American, and um, he's Australian. Subject of many sometimes good, sometimes not so good dinner conversations and fights. So I think for Australians, and again, I've only been here 25 years, not 60,000, um, native, non-native for indigenous plants and, and for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and, and non-indigenous peoples such as myself and even Leon has always been contentious. So um, it's, you know, what I love about um, Leon's garden and the way he writes about it, but also the way he works in, 
his garden and talks about doing, seeing, seeing, doing, is its two-way knowledges. And so for those of you who are Aboriginal scholars or who actually work with Aboriginal people, um, there's this, not an idea of a right or a wrong, it's just more than one way of knowing. And Leon, you know, throughout the book, um, has a pretty good dig at some politicians who I would have even a worse dig at, but also talks about, you know, I can't see Australia through, I can understand and I can empathise, but I can't see it through an Aboriginal way of being. I understand regimes of care, I understand caring for country, but I ha I'm coloured by who I am and my experiences in life. But what I do is find ways to experiment in my garden, knowing about this kind of two ways of knowledge. And at the same time, the book is very mindful of talking about how even before the 60,000 years of knowledges and, and the ways in which regimes of care that Bill Gamage and others and, and lots of indigenous voices have begun, begun and raised for now, I think about 30 years, um, it's not untouched, right? This ideal, the idea that you know, and this is where that gets up my craw, which is where my partner and I have some pretty interesting conversations around um, biosecurity, right? So I'm, I'm very American, and the largest speed in, species of weeds in the world is the eucalyptus. Where is that from? Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, for me, it's just a displaced tree, but if it grows better in Southern California, where I'm from, great, because we have problems growing lots of stuff there. So uh, f f that's my attitude. My partner would not agree with that. But coming back to your question, there's a tension there, but why aren't we thinking about two-way knowledges? And then when I'm working with the indigenous rangers, and I talk about myself as a weed, because I, I don't physically belong in this country, right? I'm not Australian, I'll never be Australian. 26 years later, I can't even sound like you guys. I mean, but, but I live here, so aren't I a weed? And aren't all the refugees, and, and actually all the white people are pretty much weeds. So th the reality is, is that if we continue this stupid binary in, in plants, and, and animals and humans. We're not gonna get anywhere with climate change. We're not gonna get anywhere with crises. Um, so for me, I'm, I'm kind of interested in the yes and, and, the, and the, the kind of allowing for a range of species, both native and non-native, and the way in which Leon's regimes of care, his very thoughtful way of doing almost meditative comes out in the book and then he steps back and he sees and then he thinks about, has a memory surface and then he does again. And, and an understanding that he's not the last person that's gonna live there and it's, that garden is not gonna be there in the way it is now in perpetuity, nor is he the first person who lived there. And kind of accepting that process of becoming as perpetual. And, and that's what the rangers have been working on with me. Is, so if, if you're ever privy to going to a, a cold burn or a cultural burn, the women stand in a circle and they burn in, which is different to the men, at least in the country that I'm currently working in. And I'm like, I've, I've only ever seen burning in a line because that's the way the CFA, but also the men burn. And that's a very different system. So I, I can't ask those questions because at that point it's not appropriate, but it doesn't mean that both are not valid ways of operating. And so coming back to your question, <laughs> very long answer and thinking through it yes there's a tension but in the same way that I don't all want all the native marsupials don't beat me up after this people or I don't want all the native species to die out but I think we have to come to some agreement that we've been maintaining and humans have been maintaining this land for a very long time and have been cultivating it and providing various regimes of care and that if we accept that it's always in a process of becoming, weeds are just not really weeds. Mm -hmm. So I look at it that way. Yeah. My, my partner would just be in the audience, hopefully he's online going, yeah! <laughs> <laughs> but no, he just wouldn't see it that way at all. Right, yeah. right. I mean, I have to say, just listening to your accent, I think you're a bit of a hybrid now, to be frank you with really you. Are. <laughs> 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 the the um, the book was written against the backdrop of the, the pandemic, obviously, as I mentioned earlier. Um, but of course, the, 
perhaps the more existentially threatening global catastrophe that's, that's, that's ongoing is, is climate change. In the context of that idea, Leon, of we all have agency over a quarter, quarter acre or less, what, what, what does it mean to garden against that little global scale of catastrophe? I do a little bit of thinking about that in the book, and, and largely prompted by Anna Katarina Piras, who's a landscape architect <clears throat> from Sardinia, and who lives in Florence and in Sardinia, and does a lot of work with refugees. And um, she, when I, I started talking to her about this, what I was writing, and she started saying, oh, well, um, what about Boccaccio's de Cameron, you know, and, and, and the Black Death, and, and uh, you, you have to think about it like that. And I, th I, I th was a bit taken aback, because it seemed to me, given her ancestry, she, she had access to Boccaccio directly. Whereas for me, to go to Dimux and buy a copy of it, and refresh my <coughs> memory about it, was, was really coming to it from the outside. And I thought, do I have the right? Anyway, I mean, it was fascinating. It, it was in a garden, a bunch of people in a garden trying to ride out a catastrophe and talking largely about sex. <laughs> but, but almost always, but there was no sex going on at all. There was no, there's absolutely <laughs> no sex takes place. But there's an awful lot of what happened in the past and what might happen in the future. But, uh, so that was, that was part of it, and I was thinking about it, because, of course, I mean, I'm interested in how the whole of us is involved with what, what we're doing. We're, not, we're not, not compartmentalizing. So part of what the book meanders through is an attempt to avoid compartmentalizing so that you, well, all of the things that we do, food, films, uh, uh, reading, <coughs> And not, not, not enough dancing, I reflect, but anyway, um, come, come into it. So then Anna Katapurina told me that, um, because she, had a con uh, uh, she reported on the president of Italy saying at the Palace of the Doria Pamphili, which is apparently the presidential retreat, that our only hope in all of these crises facing us now, was to garden our way out. And I thought, wow. And, and if you then go back to Bill Gamage and the way in which the, he argues that the entire continent was gardened, and there are these wonderful examples showing what it looked like when it was being gardened, as opposed to <clears throat> the kind of rank overgrowth, uncared, untended, which is what wilding tends to result in. And you can think then, if you can garden a continent, you can actually begin to look at how you can adapt every part of it to, to what's happening. And the, the, so yes, the quarter acre is a bit of a fantasy because sadly, most people now, even in the suburbs, are getting less than that. <clears throat> There's less and less space in which one can do things. Now, I mean, Hugh Stretton, who used to write about suburbia and about the um, sustainable sustainability in, in, in a suburban setting and how everyone could actually grow their own food <coughs> on, on a very small amount of land. Um, so that I'm looking at scales of things from right down to tiny things. Now, Stuart Geddes, who designed the book, showed me what he's been doing over the last summer in, in, a, in a tiny backyard, which was actually just a carport. And he's turned it into a most extraordinary garden. And, and it, it's, there's a roller shutter door which can go up and down, but every surface in it is now something which begins to grow or revert it to growing things. So even at that scale, and then you go back up to the president of Italy saying, well, what do we do? How do, how do we deal with, with adapting to the, our inability to do anything about climate change, it would appear? And how do, how do we deal with that catastrophe? 
And we can either throw our hands up and say there's nothing we can do, or we can actually um, do the ridiculous things that Andrew and I have done on quarter of an acre, where we planted, I think, over 30 trees in, in, at Wood End. We've planted, uh, supplemented the ones now in Harcourt with, an, with another dozen, and that, that will go on. And we're just, well, it may be pathetic, but it, it's something. <laughs> <laughs> Personally, I love that idea of a transformation through a thousand or ten thousand quarter acres. Yes. It's it's very poetic. It's beautiful. And Sue Ann, you're obviously used to thinking and working at much larger scales than a quarter acre. Do you think the kind of cultural change that would be necessary to affect that transformation through ten thousand or a thousand quarter acres is feasible? Is that is that hopelessly romantic? No, I was thinking about like um, I think they call it citizen science, which I love these frame, you know, phrases that come out. I'm like, what's that? Then I, I Wikipedia, like all good academics, and think, oh, right. So it, it reminds me of, so in Western Sydney, up my way, a bit, I'm a bit further north, when they discovered that um, the urban heat island effect was going to impact the, that massive expansion of city, which is happening in Melbourne. It's happening, it's really happening in Newcastle. It's happening in most regional centres where trees have been ripped out for a range of really silly reasons and we've paved stuff. And so Western Sydney decides it's going to re-green it, right? And because it's a major voting pocket, let's not pretend that, you know, sustainability and, and how to buy votes is through, well, let's, let's help th those poor people in Western Sydney who are quite diverse in ethnicity. They decide they're going to add five million trees. That's what the Greater Western Sydney Commission decides. So, but no one's thought to look at where they're going to go, right? So there's this idea that there's all this parkland, which if you know the, the kind of appropriate geomorphology and the kinds of stuff that should grow in Western Sydney, it's actually grasslandy. <laughs> it's like growing trees out in, you know, Western Victoria, right? Mm, not so good, right? Not a good idea. It's probably better for grasslands. And so then they're kind of trying to... So they can't do it in the parklands because there's not enough space, but there's also no way to grow it in in a way in which you don't have to irrigate and do all the really fun stuff that you have to do for trees in that space because it's hot and dry. So then they say, well, what would happen if we gave three million trees to the various, uh, what I would call immigrants and, you know, first family of immigrants who live in Western Sydney? Um, could they do it? Because, again, similarly, the suburbs in Western Sydney have similar density issues and the quarter-acre block is... I would say with zero lot lines, probably a couple pots and a balcony for some. And so that doesn't work. So in the end, what they end up doing to get the five million trees <laughs> is they plant them along the freeway <laughs> and they irrigate them and they use the water from the freeway and they try to har harvest it and, and take out the heavy metals. Um, but what's silly and fascinating about that story at the same time is that the citizen science told them that people wanted to plant food. So when they said, here, have a tree, because that you'll help with climate change and urban heat island effect, and people went, thanks, and it ended up probably in landfill, what happened is they, they then tried, well, actually, here, have 10 packets of vegetable plants, all in relationship to people's cultural food identity. Same amount of carbon storage, by the way. Same exact amount of, in, in terms of carbon sequestration. And it doesn't take as long, right? And obviously then people eat it and they replant. So I found it really, you know, some of the enlightenment moments for me with the, this idea that everyone with a backyard or a balcony or even just a window box can help is actually quite... It's actually quite astonishing that it can, but also that it, it, we, what we saw in terms of lockdowns and people not having access to public space or green or s seeing a sky, that also helps combat that, which, again, I'm not a theorist, but the whole biophilic movement sort of taps into this need to have some sort of carbon form of life that's green and photosynthesizing as a part of your daily life. Mm, mm. So even if it's the balcony. Yeah. yeah, as long as you can get it, get an eye on it and be part of that experience and yep. part of your ecology.
I mean, it's obviously, I spent a group, well, didn't grow up in Brunswick, but lived there for a long time. Um, and, you know, there's private orchards all over that suburb, and they're all gradually just being demolished, sadly, to be replaced with infill, you know, medium density apartment buildings. Um, in relation to that, Leon, in, in the book, your partner, Andrew, makes the observation that it takes five generations to make a, make a good garden. Um, gardening then becomes an act made in conversation with, with other generations across time. And in your book, though, you also note that this act could be, it could be generous or it could be grandiose or even potentially pretentious. Where and how would you draw the distinction there? Goodness. <laughs> <laughs> The things one thinks and, s and writes. Anyway, um, yeah, uh, in the, w the Wood End Garden, it was, was really interesting in the sense that it, it was on a sort of a, a watershed. And I, I was able to track back through perfunctory research to um, sort of poke kind of Aboriginal history for it, where it's, it's on the borderline between two, two groups, and Hanging Rock, which is not far away, was obviously a place where three groups regularly came together for ritual things. So the, you could see that before it became orchards, um, which is what that part of Woodend eventually became, it had, it, it had been grassland, which was associated with, with, with Hanging Rock. And then there was the grid of the orchard going through it, and then further subdivision, <coughs> and um, the, 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 the garden I was working on was first laid out by a family who were um, part Italian and part Anglo-Australian. <coughs> and the whole, the whole idea behind what they did was influenced by the picturesque, so that there was an attempt to actually make sure that the flow of everything suggested that they were associated with continuing countryside. And then, so that's you know, three, three generations. I came in and, and, and did things which tied it back to <coughs> my experience of the garden at Buddha in Castle Main, which I first encountered 35 years ago. And, and there were things I saw there that absolutely fascinated me, and I replicated those, only to discover that I went back to Buddha, they disappeared from Buddha, <laughs> <coughs> they weren't there anymore. So, and I thought that was a lovely indication of how an idea can float through physical form. So that's four generations. Then, then uh, for various reasons to do with retiring and COVID and all the rest of it, the, the, the whole wood end situation was not tenable anymore and, and we moved. And the people who bought that garden want to build a small house on it, but they bought it because they thought it was a beautiful garden. So it's, a <clears throat> and whether that's a little battle which is going to result in anything, I don't know. But, yeah, I mean, I, I've, <clears throat> I'm aware in my own mind that, uh, you know, you go back through, through gardens. There's a, a book that I got my hands on recently, thanks to my son's enterprise, which was Beverly Nichols' book from the 19, late 1920s, called Down the Garden Path. And this is a story of, of him becoming a gardener. With a, in a garden, and all of the things that he encountered uh, on the way, including very noisy, nosy neighbours and people who knew better, and all sorts of things. But um, so there's a long history, of, and you could see what he was doing. He maps it out, and I'd been aware of this book for a long time. And so that book, in a funny sort of way, is another generation. So what, what I'm driving at is that it's not simply the generation that actually does things, but every one of us, as we read, I mean, those <clears throat> many of us have been fascinated by Derek Jarman's garden on the, the, the Pebble Beach, and 
at, at Dungeness, and, and, and that sits in the background. And I, there were times in Wood End when I could see, just because you look at it, and, and there was a lot of gravel laid down, and weeds blew in. And these are probably indigenous weeds. <laughs> anyway. Hybrids, at least. <laughs> <laughs> and they came up, and they were so beautiful. They made basket-like shapes. And, and I didn't have the heart to pull them up. So <laughs> I got. And eventually, I realized that you could pull them up because they'd come again. <laughs> 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 and... So, so I, and I could see in thinking of that, I was, there was another generation that I was picking up. I think the grandiose part of it is, 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 is some of the sterility around um, purely geometrical forms and, and a kind of fascination that there was for a long time where people always wanted to replicate Vita Sackville West's white garden, but not the other. It's of the garden, you know. So the, the white garden was what, just one part of that fabulous construct. And of course, it's, it's, an, it, it's very easy for people like the Nicholsons and the Sackville Wests because they've, they've been kind of embedded in that landscape for a long time. And it'd be interesting to see how the um, understanding of country which some people are pursuing, and I mention that in the book too, you know, can we re revise agriculture? Can we reintroduce different regimes of burning? Can we really garden our way out of this using the ancient knowledge and all of those generations? Mm. I really love the idea of a, a garden as a repository of ideas. I mean, that's a really potent concept, but um, obviously some of us are conscious of those ideas and, and perhaps we're not conscious, self-consciously introducing those ideas into our landscapes. But um, one of the ideas that you return to, and in fact you dedicate an entire uh, chapter to this precedent, is Alhambra. And of course that's an enormous landscape complex. So some, some people might be wondering how uh, an, a landscape of that size and scale and complexity could be introduced into a quarter acre or less. Uh, well, I had a, a confession to make because I, the Alhambra has stood in my mind for many, many years. Uh, an example of what you do when you're doomed. <laughs> and, you know, so you, you can either just give up or you actually... Build a pleasure palace. Yes. <laughs> Have a good time. <laughs> And you, you carry on like that, but 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 you you see, I mean, you see it all over. I mean, the, the the in many ways the the courtyards of the Alhambra relate to the paradise gardens that you find in in Persia, and and those can be shrunk down to the size of a carpet, and you can actually move those carpets around with you. I mean, one of my mentors <coughs> always said the the two things that you always had to have ready to move with you. And one was your books and the other was your carpets. And your carpets are your little paradise gardens. And I do, I do have, I've <coughs> found one, a carpet which has four pencil pines and it repeats and it, so it has that whole pattern. It's quite obvious in that way. And in fact, an expert in carpets sniffed at it as being far too obvious. But <laughs> <laughs> But so, you know, it's the scale of it is, is, is terrific. What I hadn't realised, and I've just re been reading, doing some re more reading about the Alhambra, I did realise that in a way their doom came not so much from the Christians as from their own internecine battles. And, and, and the, le the latest history of it shows that nobody who was a ruler in Alhambra died naturally in bed. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps they died in the garden from having too much fun. <laughs> like George Bernard Shaw, <laughs> falling out of a tree at the age of 90, yeah. 
I, mean, I think it's a, it's a beautiful example of a, of, a, of a garden that was actually constructed across centuries. It's a genuine conversation across generations there. And, and none of the various rulers, the Suffered rulers, had authorship over it, really, at no. any point. True. Um, but and, and it's a work of engineering, water engineering, and all sorts of things, I'm using, yeah. And they add new bits. Do they and they don't bits? try to preserve... They understand trees and plants are going to die, and they often use new cultivars and experiments. It's actually, I mean, I've been a few times, um, most most recently in 2015, and what was interesting is that they had completely given up. There's a, a part which is an orangery, right, which is like a, a really fragrant, beautiful... I mean, I, I have bad spatial history with oranges and Leon knows all about that but um, and as do my research assistants who've come today but for, for me um, the most interesting conversation we had in 2015 with one of the gardeners there was that they'd switched to Portuguese oranges <laughs> because of course the Spanish ones weren't resilient enough and they hadn't mucked around enough with it genetically to, no. to continue to use them in the artery. So they had <laughs> gone to Portugal, which is where my grandfather was from, who was an orange orchardist. He was an orchardist who moved to Southern California. So I was like, see, <laughs> weeds work. No, sorry, but it is really interesting. They're still cultivating and they're still experimenting in the Alhambra and they're still open to things that we tried, I mean, this comes back to, I reread Civilizing the City, which is Georgia Whitehead, Georgina Whitehead's book about um, Melbourne and, and the parks and gardens around Melbourne. And the title always irked me because civilizing is such a, no offense, British and a colonial idea of politeness. And we must be civil, which if you're American, it just goes like that, right? Um, but, but the reality is, is that when um, I was here before I left to move to Newcastle, there were all these kind of around in and around, and I happened to be in Fitzroy, and we lived there for 10 years, and I walked across Carlton Gardens, and people were freaking out about, obviously, the trees going into senescence, which means they're going to die, and, the, and the, the Carlton Heritage Gardens, there were all sorts of wars about trying to keep them as they were, but it's a garden. And you can't, it's going to do what it does, let it die. <laughs> and, there, and, and it's funny because the Alhambra and even Versailles, they're still experimenting and doing new stuff. Yet in, at that time in Carlton, in the Carlton Gardens and in Fitzroy, they were fighting about changing anything. Yeah. And, you know, and then they put possum guides up mm -hmm. because, of course, the possums are killing the trees faster. It's like, but the trees are dying anyway. <laughs> So it's this whole thing. It's it's quite funny. We want to we want to keep a garden in time, but it can. Yeah. It was antithetical to the whole <laughs> process, yeah. isn't it? it, it I, I I think the thing about Alhambra that fascinates me is obviously it's a it's a pleasure palace and it's a it's a place for retreat. But one of the things you talk about in the book throughout really is this idea of kind of a reverie, gardening as a reverie, and the process of. The obviously deadheading at Clevedon is, is one one kind of reverie, just through sheer tedium. You obviously develop a little kind of meditative process that you need to, to, to effectively just get yourself through it. But it can also be quite a productive experience in the way that you were describing it. Um, you, you talk about it as, a, as gardening being a, a seamless extension from playing and working in gardens to designing rooms inside and outside, rural and urban. Um, I guess from that perspective, you've, you've, you sort of positioned that idea of reverie as a sort of a subconscious but productive state within which you can kind of design to a degree. Um, how would you describe the core act of designing? Is it, is it misguided to see it as a, as a purely conscious and, and deliberative act? One of the things that I've come to understand is that we all know a lot more than we know that we know. Uh, this is true of everybody. And one of the, I mean, I can give many instances of this, and, but one of the things that you, you need to do during a design process, obviously you have to go through all of the, the rational ordering and the quantifying and all the rest of it, but, but 
so many of us experience this, that you, you've gone through all your research, you've got everything in place, and it just doesn't gel. And then <clears throat> how does it, it all come together again? It comes together through some process of reverie, sometimes in a dream, sometimes you just wake up and go, oh, goodness, that's it. And it's, it's, it's a process that enables you to actually get in touch with all the things that you do know but can't hold at the surface of your intellectual mind. So I think, I think that's what's going on there. <clears throat> and I was privileged to study under <coughs> Richard Hamilton at the University of Newcastle on Tyne um, in the 1964-5. And we, we went through a series of exercises under his leadership. And, and one of them was simply about line, just identifying lines everywhere. And at the end of the week, you couldn't look at anything without seeing it as composed of lines. And I thought, this always struck me. I mean, it was true of almost all the exercises at the end of a week of immersion. You saw the world very differently. And I think that uh, this, those of us who do a lot of weeding will know that after a day of weeding, all you can see is the weed that, you <laughs> that you've been digging up. <laughs> I don't know. And, um, so, and I, you know, I've done a lot of weeding for a, a particularly nasty weed in Cornwall. Um, and I know, I mean, if it wasn't for my friends Kate and Julian coming up with a wonderful meal and a lot of wine after that, the whole <laughs> night would have still been embedded with this <laughs> elderflower weed that you had to take up and get every last white tendril out of the soil. Yeah, so, but back to your serious thing, yes, I mean, I think and there are a lot of people in here who are far better designers than <clears throat> I've ever been, but yeah, that there are these times where you, you just have to let go, and the whole thing wells up in ways that are unanticipated. I'm gonna keep the serious thing going for just a fraction more, at the risk of boring you all to tears, but Sue Ann, you've, you've obviously been working a lot in Newcastle with detoxifying landscapes. A lot of your work's incredibly research-driven. It's numbers and data and measurements, quantifying and, and so on. Has, has what Leon's described, does that gel with, with you in terms of your experience as a landscape architect, your design experience? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. So I, I think I was one of the first landscape architects to do the PhD, if not the first, which was terrifying in its own way. And when we were thinking about my spatial histories and I, I confessed over lunch and after a glass of rosé, I'll say right now, to Matt that I'm not a real big fan of nature. Big surprise. Landscape architect, not such a good person in nature. Not that I don't think it's important and that there isn't value in natural, but if you grew up in South Central where I did, your conceptions of nature are very different to say if you grew up in the bush. And so one of the things that surfaced during my PhD that comes up in this research is that, um, so I'm not a big fan of really enclosed gardens and enclosed rooms of gardens. I find them really beautiful, but I, I find myself looking for that vista. Now, part of that's being from South Central Los Angeles, where they absolutely mowed down everything so that the cops so either the cops or the gangs could see <laughs> who was coming, and both of them in my childhood were enemies, both the cops and the gangs. And so I, I have an absolute love of vistas and actual fields, which weirdly enough is if before Southern California was conquered by the conquistadores, um, was actually grassland, right? So actually it should just be lots of big wide open fields, but it's not. And so what, what, coming back to what we're doing in Newcastle with very toxic land, and I don't think Newcastle's alone in this, and in fact, if many of you get your soil tested right here in Melbourne, given the layers of things that have gone on here, you'll probably find some interesting stuff. And you might want to eat out of raised garden beds, but, but <laughs> and I say that as a public service announcement. <laughs> but, um, 
my favorite parts of the gardens we're doing there. And we're doing everything from kind of, we've, we've inherited a two and a half acre site called Del Pratt, which is the first BHP like CEO who decided he, he commuted by train up from Melbourne during the week. So 18 hours on a train, not fun at the time, built in this kind of funny little heritage cottage and it overlooked the steel yards, right, and the creosote factory and all the tasty stuff that goes along with industrialization. So he builds this garden and this house. That the, the garden ones wasn't much except for some beautiful Morton Bay figs. But we've inherited this site as a university and it's highly toxic. Pretty much everything except for radiation, except for there is apparently a bit of radiation on a corner that we thankfully own with someone else. And we've been doing these experiments to take out the toxins using plants. And the, the edible part of the garden, we've found that carrots take out not just the arsenic within a meter around the actual carrot, but they take it out for the entire part within a certain water catchment. So our, that part of our site is now free of toxins after one year of carrots. Now, you wouldn't want anyone to eat those carrots, right? <laughs> so you, then you have to like put on your website if you find that you have intolerable levels of arsenic, plant carrots, but don't eat them. But more importantly is things like sunflowers. So those of you who know about sunflowers, when um, DDT was used to, to, and to defoliate in Vietnam with Agent Orange, one of the ways they got the toxins out from that was they planted sunflower fields. And imagine the rice paddies and things like that in Vietnam and the, and the high water tables. So we had some similar things th that were defoliators because they're, they're spraying down the rail tracks. They're trying to keep the, the very luscious landscapes of Newcastle out of the industrial zone. When we planted the um, sunflowers, they were great at doing what we wanted in terms of phytoremediation, but we were also really interested in where they held the toxins. So if they hold it in the root, it's much safer for pollinators, so bees, birds, and everything else. But if they hold it in the flower, you understand where some of those toxins might be going, and also the tolerances of various um, insected insects. Um, and so I've been doing this for a while, but I have to say in doing all this stuff, I'm working with a scientist, it's not me. I'm certainly working with a landscape architect who's better at plants than I ever will be. And, and lots of weeding. We were laughing about weeding because we spend hours weeding, particularly before open day. And so much so that our scientists said, let's just keep the weeds and hope that they take some toxins out. <laughs> um, and, but my favorite part and, and experience of these gardens has been when they get to that feral state, not because of rewilding. Like, I don't believe that being Edna Walling 101 is gonna somehow bring back a landscape that probably never existed in the first place. What, why I like them is, is kind of similar to Piet Olaf, who you also have a lovely part of your garden in one end that you kind of dedicated to a Piet Olaf, which is that you kind of make these clumpy things and they might work and they might not. We have a series of meadows that we turn over. And the first year we had this you know, blue cornflower meadow and it looked like it could have been really good for Melbourne. We could have sold them <laughs> for some horse race or something. But like, And then we had three days of over 50 degrees and the whole thing died. So we had it for two days and then it just died. <laughs> And then this year we had a mixed meadow on one side and a sunflower meadow on the other. And again, we're getting really great results in terms of taking toxicity out, which is the purpose of these particular gardens. But when they get to that feral kind of I, you can't control me stage is when I actually really start. They're not quite beautiful. They're in bloom, right? That's great. But actually when they just start escaping and going over the fence and they start doing stuff that we're not supposed to let them do, I like them the best. And it, I think that comes back to the LA thing where it's partially about horizon, but it's also, and, and you know, Morales and terrain fog and post-industrial sites where they're defying control, right? And, and there, there's a sense of freedom and liberation. And we all know the kinds of things that happen in spaces that we're not watching, right? Both with humans, animals, and weeds. 
Um, and that defy of control, for me, um, plays out in those kind of horizontal spaces. And that comes back to my own spatial history and probably the oil fields of South Central Los Angeles, which are where if you ever want to dump a body car or just have a really interesting <laughs> afternoon, you go. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> long answer. <laughs> and that's on Yeka. My sisters are going to love that one. <laughs> so to bring things back to Wood End. <laughs> <laughs> Don't think there's been a drive-by shooting in Wood End ever in its history. Well, may may well have been. I couldn't say, but um, no. But on that, I, I, I've run out of questions, so I've got one more, and then I'll throw it out to the floor. But but that idea of control and and uh, and uh, uh, the limits of control and let and the letting go. Um, I'm wondering if that's a principle that you've learned over time in your own gardening, Leon, and in fact in your own professional practice and so forth. Getting back to that idea of generosity. Yeah, <clears throat> definitely. I mean, for many years I, I did the heavy labour in my mother's garden, and uh, what you, this was in, in, in Buckinghamshire in England, and that's a very gentle gardening environment compared to South <laughs> Los Angeles. But um, what used to amaze her was that she never knew for sure where things were going to come up. They wandered around. You know, so one year you'd get jacked by the hedge all down one side of the garden and the next year suddenly it was on the other side. And the primroses did a similar thing, they just moved about. And she just thought, you know, it was it was raging. I mean nothing stayed where you put it. <laughs> it just and that she celebrated. And I love that too. I mean I love that with um, with what happened at Wood End. I mean it, and these, these, these plants are called volunteers, which I love, you know, because, and, and yes, well, well, I, we, I put in some um, sea ivy, sea holly at, at, at Wood End, and I put it where I thought it should be, but it had other ideas. <laughs> and, it, and it colonized whole areas, and I mean, in the end I was just not getting rid of all of it, but actually, giving it a haircut uh, <laughs> in some ways to try and just you know, to keep passages through it. You had, but I had no idea it was going to do that. Foxgloves do the same, they're wonderful. You, you never quite know where a foxglove is going to come up. And I've seen, I mean, I've seen things that I've tried to replicate because it, Bendigo, with, which is to the north of where we are now, and <clears throat> I was thinking I can learn some lessons from Bendigo because it's hotter, drier. And, I, and there are some old houses there with head, privet hedges and growing through the hedges on the shade side are hollyhocks, foxgloves, and I just thought, wow, I'm going to try that. Didn't work. <laughs> oh, no. so, yeah, um, so yes, I don't know whether I'm, I'm, I'm just but rambling, but, but it is, uh, as somebody once said to me when I was a dean, you know, how do you define a good dean and I said you back everything that moves <laughs> and th that's my sense of generosity <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean certainly this, the, the sea holly sounded like a good opportunity for reverie anyway maybe a week or two of <laughs> non-stop weeding um, do we have any do we have any questions from the floor guys that's a one from the back the yarn I think, well, uh, first of all, to mention that this is a painting by Kath Stutterheim, who, um, and it's, it's of um, a valley in the N Natal, Natal Drakensberg. And I s spent most of the summers and Easters of my childhood in that valley. And this was a... <coughs> A, a lodge, a very primitive one, thatched, um, 
And then I was really lucky enough to actually allow my children to have an experience of that same valley before, before uh, passing it over to become <clears throat> a, a part of a national park. And um, the, those, are, those are sandstone cliffs below a layer of lava. The whole thing is colonized by grass. And in the foreground, there is a garden that was planted during the Depression by one of my grandfather's younger sisters. And they, and they had no way of sustaining themselves, so they moved to this very remote place, which was 52 miles from the nearest shop. They planted an orchard. They planted a garden. Um, this, so, yeah. They're not, they're not trees. I, I've, I used to pride myself on knowing that landscape really well and finding my way through it. And uh, we had Eland on passing through. The, the, the valley's name is Game Pass because it was one of the transhumans passes where the, the, the Eland used to go from the coastal plains and migrate in the summer up into the mountains. And there are amazing Bushman paintings uh, in the caves, in those sandstone cliffs. Um, some of which, I'm delighted to say, found a place in a wonderful TV series and book about how art changed the world. And yeah, mm. so, yes. More layers, more generations. <laughs> Is it a landscape? Do you feel any resonance with here in Australia, or is there, is there any connection there at all? Um, not really, but no, it's very different. It, apart, apart from anything else, it's its altitude. It's um, you know, it's very high up. <clears throat> it's quite wet. Mm. Um, but uh, I was travelling with with Ginny Lee, who's um, a colleague of ours, <clears throat> to to. <coughs> Her, um, would you call it a farm? No. Anyway, in in, in uh, the Flinders Ranges, in, and uh, we were in in her four wheel drive, and we were travelling through this landscape. And she, we looked out of the window, and she said, looking at the bleached grass, "This must be very like South Africa." And I said, "Well, superficially, yes, but if this was South Africa, and we got out of the car, it would be freezing cold." Mm not high summer, because it's a completely inverted climatic system. So there, the grass is green in the summer and goes dry in the winter. So, yeah, they're, they're very different. I mean, the, and the, I, I encountered the Flinders Ranges with the same kind of awestruck amazement as this valley always induced in me, but it was a totally different experience. And it was, I mean, there was so much about it that one just couldn't reconcile with one's previous understanding of what a landscape was. The fact that everything was red, and then there were these little Christmas trees, standing, which are a native Cyprus. Quite extraordinary, iridescent mm. landscape. Yeah. Do we have any other any other questions, guys? Well, I, I confess to being mad about the oak lawn. And as one of the places you can go when it's 40 degrees and it'll be cool. But I just love that coverage. Um, and I, I love the different, different oaks. And it's really interesting to see which ones thrive here. Yes, I think I have two, actually, because I lived in Melbourne for about 18 years before moving out to Newcastle. And... Um, the first is just the tan, the track that you run around. Because not that I was ever frustrated in my job at RFIT, <laughs> but I, I'm a very physical person. So when I when I and and again, you know, for me, if I'm running or walking or doing something at a pace, that helps me find reverie. But it also means that I don't do naughty 
mischievous things. And so the tan track for me, I really loved. And, you know, every now and again, in my younger years, I would see Kathy Freeman running it. So I'd just be like, <laughs> holy, and I'd just think, just get out of the way, get out of the way. <laughs> and then the other bit is the children's garden. And I think I just like it, well, you know, you know how plants kind of, we've been talking about how plants kind of defy control. So do children and lots of people, right? And what they do in that garden, I just love how they just, they do all sorts of stuff that no one ever predicted. And, and in a way, that kind of wonderment and kind of not even worrying about what mum and dad are worrying about or even who's watching. There's something really quite lovely about the way that garden is open to that, whereas lots of gardens, oh, don't touch it or, you know, don't eat it or don't put your hand in the dirt, where I find that children's garden to be the exact opposite. Yeah. I want to add, <coughs> add a bit because I, I love that bit where you hear the bellbirds. Yeah. And uh, I... That's Many, many years ago, I met my son in the, in the Dordogne in, uh, in, in Bordeaux and, uh, and, the, and after that travelled on a train back to, back to Paris and the carriages were working against each other and I was sort of dozing after we'd had lunch together and the, the carriages made the sound of a bellbird and it was the first time I realised I was homesick. <laughs> <laughs> Probably got time for one more question, folks. Oh. No, I mean, I've done a lot of work with communities as, as, as Sue Ann, and what, what I've thought is that it's our responsibility to engage people in such a way that they can reveal their spatial histories and reveal at the same time our spatial history and, and somehow create a dialogue between them and that becomes part of the design process. And there's some, some architects are really good at that. Um, or business of getting the whole or a commun representative community group to actually begin to reveal through finger painting and other things like that <laughs> what, what the histories in space are. And in some way you do need to regress to that kind of touchy, feely hands things to do it. So yes, I think, I think finding ways to create the dialogue are, are important, but I think the crucial thing f for designers is, is for them to know that they have these prejudices that, that when, when you say, this will be comfortable, it, there's no such thing as absolute comfort. It is your idea of comfort. And uh, I mean, as a young and <clears throat> arrogant architect, I remember presenting a house design to a client and she eventually burst out. She said, it's my house. <laughs> I don't know. I don't see it. <laughs> I've tried to avoid that ever since. <laughs> well, on that note, guys, I think we'll, we'll probably wrap up now. We, we obviously do have the book available today for a slight discount um, just out there in the hallway. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming, and, and please join me in thanking our speakers today.